roots of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Hello, dear listeners. We are continuing to read from the book Spiritual Awakening, the second volume in the series Spiritual Councils by St. Paisios. Crossing the waters as on dry land, in that way escaping from the evils of Egypt's land. All things should raise us to God. Yeroda, you have told us that all things should raise us upward to God. How can we achieve this? By utilizing everything for the good. When everything is geared to the spiritual life, do you know how much spiritual benefit can be derived and what spiritual experience can be achieved? For example, you touch cement and you can find God. You touch brick and you touch God. You touch this, you touch God. You touch that, you touch God. You touch something else and you touch God. Yes, touch God through everything. If one does not approach the spiritual life in this way, if one does not see God in everything he does, then he will still be far from God, even if you place him in the church. Give him the hymns of the church to chant, and he will still be far from God. Give him a spiritual book to read, and again he will be far from God. Whatever spiritual things you give him to do, it will not lead him to God. Everyone, whatever he sees, whatever he does, whether he is sewing clothes or embroidering, must utilize everything spiritually. Does he look upon flowers? He has looked upon God. Does he look upon swine? Yes, my child, again he has seen God. But you might ask, how can I see God through the swine? You see how the benevolent God has made the swine giving them a snout with which to find the wild bulbs in the earth without seeing them. Its nose is so made that it doesn't get cut when it encounters sharp objects, glass, thorns, and so on. One should say that God has created with wisdom, not only when he sees the fragrant and beautiful flower, but also when he sees the swine. There too he should see God. And if I think how God could have made me into a pig rather than a man, does this seem strange to you? Couldn't God have made us into swine? Many times hunters will wound a wild boar and be unable to find it. Then other wild beasts go and eat the poor wounded boar while it's still alive. It doesn't have any medical care and it suffers, even though it has not in any way injured its creator. Whereas human beings have wounded their creator and continue to wound him constantly, often showing gross ingratitude. This is why I say that you should work on the spiritual life in the right way. How the good God has created everything. What power he gives to the animals. The doctor says, eat meat to have strong muscles. And you see the poor bulls eating only grass, and yet they have such strength. Don't you see God in that? That is, they eat only grass, and God makes them so strong. Imagine what he does for humans. Do you understand? When someone is working this way in the spiritual life, he can reach a state of being where he's helped not only by the saints, but by sinners too. The saints strengthen us with their holy example. The sinner through his fall restrains us, reigns us in. He puts the brakes on us, not so that we won't fall in the eyes of others, but so that we won't disappoint God. The Power of Faith Yeroda, what is the seal of the Lamb? Who is the Lamb? Christ. What is his seal? 
When a Christian is baptized, the priest seals him with the sign of the cross on his forehead, using the holy miron, saying, The seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then, each time the Christian makes the sign of the cross, he reverences the saving passion of the Lord and invokes the power of the cross, which is the power of the death of our Christ on the cross. When we say, O cross of Christ, save us through your power, we invoke the power of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The cross has great power. For example, if it is raining and lightning bolts are coming down, one of them can strike a large metal cross on a church bell tower. But if a Christian is down there who has a small cross and says, O cross of Christ, save us through your power, the lightning bolt does not strike him. In the first instance, the laws of nature are at work, and the lightning bolt strikes the metal cross and knocks it down. In the second instance, a tiny little cross protects the Christian because he invokes the power of the cross of Christ. Yeronda, why is it that even though I ask for something with faith, God does not grant it? You may believe, you may ask, but if you are not humble or if you tend to be proud, God does not provide. One may have faith not only like a tiny grain of mustard seed, Matthew 17, verse 20, Luke 17, verse 6, but even like a whole kilo of mustard seeds. But if one does not also have the corresponding humility, God does not act, because man cannot benefit under such circumstances. When there is pride, faith is not active. When someone goes through life with faith, without doubt, and asks for God's help, he will experience gradually in the beginning small events and later greater ones and will become more faithful. Living the divine mysteries up close, he becomes a theologian because he doesn't comprehend them with his mind but actually lives them. His faith keeps growing because he moves in another sphere with divine events. But in order to live the mysteries of God, one must be divested of the old self and, in a sense, return to the condition before the fall. One must have innocence and simplicity so that his faith may be unshakable and absolutely certain that there is nothing God cannot do. Then, when he hears about a person who does not believe or who has doubts about certain things concerning God's help, do you know how much he suffers? Yaroda, when someone believes, can he alter the outcome of some situation through prayer? If he has great faith, he can change many things. Even if he has built his house on the course of a mountain torrent, and the torrent brings down much water, if he believes with certainty and prays to God fervently, the torrent will change direction. But he must have such faith that if he hears, for example, that a miracle has taken place and the sea has emptied and people are plowing it with tractors and hauling the fish with trucks, he will believe it. He will not want to go and see for himself, even if he lives only a hundred meters from the sea and can't see it from where he is, still he won't go to check whether it is true or not simply because he does not doubt. He knows that all things are possible for God, that the divine power is not limited, and for this reason he is not curious. That is how much faith he has. Only one who truly believes can truly live and be a true man of God. Trust in God is a child of faith. Yeronda, I feel insecure. I am anxious. Ensure yourself, my child, in God. Do you only know about car insurance? Aren't you familiar with God's insurance? Make the sign of the cross before you do anything, and say, My Christ, help me. My Panagia, help me. Is there any greater insurance than our trust in God? When man entrusts himself to God, he receives a constant supply of super gasoline, and his spiritual vehicle never stops. It runs constantly. As far as possible, be careful, pray, and entrust yourself to God, and He will help you in every difficulty. Simplify your life with an absolute trust in God, and you will be freed from any stress and anxiety. Yeroda, when people tell me to do something, I always start out with a certain fear, a certain hesitation. 
and in the end I may not do the work properly because of my fear. Make the sign of the cross my good child and do what you have been told to do. If you say, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, there are so many saints, don't you think one of them will help you? Never lose your trust in God. Don't strain yourself with your narrow human reasoning, which torments you and obstructs divine help. By entrusting yourself and your work to God besides your prudent human activity, you will certainly be greatly helped, and others will be helped as well. Entrusting ourselves to God is of tremendous importance. Once they had to draw some blood from me. There were four nurses. The first came and tormented me but couldn't find a vein. The second nurse had the same trouble. The third nurse was more experienced and she tried but again with no results. At that moment, a fourth nurse came by. She noticed how the others had tormented me and she also tried. First, she made the sign of the cross and immediately she found a vein to draw my blood because she had asked for God's help. The others, in a sense, relied only upon themselves. It's a great thing to put oneself into God's hands. People set goals and try to achieve them without listening carefully to hear the will of God and without trying to conform to it. We must entrust ourselves to God and allow Him to direct our life while we do our duty with Philotimo. If a person does not entrust himself to God so as to abandon himself entirely into God's hands, he will be tormented. People usually first turn to human consolation, and when disappointed by them, then they take refuge in God. But if we want to avoid being tormented, we must first seek divine consolation, which is, after all, the only true consolation. It is not enough merely to have faith in God. Here faith has the meaning of simply accepting the existence of God, which is not sufficient for a life in Christ. One must also have absolute trust in God. Trust in God attracts His help. The Christian believes and entrusts himself to God unto death, and then he can see clearly the hand of God guiding and saving him. The Apostle Paul says that faith is believing in the things we don't see, not merely in the things we do see. Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3 When we place our future in God's hands, we oblige Him to help us. Absolute trust in God is born of faith, with which we pray in secret and enjoy the fruit of hope. It is a constant prayer which brings divine results at the right time. It is then that man lives an angelic life and bursts out in praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah 6 verse 3 For man can make of his life a life in paradise if he trusts God, praises Him for everything, and accepts Him as a loving Father guiding his life. Otherwise, he can make his life hell. It is a wonderful thing for a man to be able to experience from this life a measure of the joy of paradise. Yeronda, concerning physical and mental health, to what extent must one put himself into the hands of God? First one must entrust himself to God, and after God, he will also entrust himself to the appropriate person. Faith and Love Yeronda, what is the relationship between faith and love? First comes faith, and then love. One must believe in order to love. One cannot love something he does not believe in. So to love God, we must believe in God. The greater our faith, the greater our hope and love and sacrifice for God and our neighbor. A fervent faith in God brings forth a fervent love for God and for the image of God, our fellow man. Out of the abundance of our love that cannot be contained in the heart and overflows, the poor animals also benefit. We believe strongly and we love strongly. If our faith is lukewarm, our love will be lukewarm. If our faith is fervent, our love will be fervent. Our faith must have philotimo, and that's where the philotimo-filled struggle begins. And the more we struggle with philotimo, the more our faith will increase, and the more our love will increase. In this philotimo-filled struggle, it helps greatly to keep God's blessings in mind. Someone who has a strong sense of philotimo 
does not wonder if there is paradise, but struggles, because he believes and loves God. Whereas someone who does not have Philotimo will begin to wonder, why should I even struggle? Does paradise really exist? Will there be a judgment day? And when someone is ungrateful, no matter what you do for him, he will still be ungrateful. Whereas the man who has Philotimo praises God, even in a time of temptation, and will gradually start being continuously grateful to God. That's when the divine transformation comes to his soul, keeping him in constant joy and gladness. Another person may have no temptations or trials of any kind, and only have blessings, and yet will never be satisfied with anything. After our love for God comes sacrifice, and when there is sacrifice without any trace of selfishness, then one begins to be blessed with divine events. I must make a sacrifice for no other reason than for God who created this universe and provides us with so many blessings. You see, even the pagans who deified aspects of nature, worshipping the sun, the great rivers, often sacrifice themselves for this faith of theirs. If they sacrifice themselves for creation, how much more should we sacrifice ourselves for the Creator? People don't believe, and so they don't sacrifice themselves. All our indifference stems from this. One blasphemes and curses the holy and sacred things, while another half believes and is tormented. For one to have true spiritual joy, he must have faith and love. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15 verse 5 if man is to stop being tormented, he must believe in what Jesus Christ said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. This means that man must lose hope in himself in a good sense and put his faith and trust in God. When someone loses hope in himself, again in the good sense, it is then that he finds God. My every hope I place in you. Theodokion Hymn of Tone 2 even the most spiritual people do not have their life secured, and that's why they keep themselves constantly in the security of God, entrusting themselves to God and giving up any hope in their own ego, for it is this ego which brings man every spiritual misfortune. Self-confidence is our greatest and worst enemy, because it can suddenly blow us up and leave us in utter misery on the street. When man has self-confidence, he is bound and unable to do anything, or is left to struggle alone. Then he will unavoidably be overcome by the enemy or fail in his efforts, thus annihilating his ego. Often the benevolent God very wisely provides for us also to see his divine intervention and the failure we had with our self-confidence. When one observes and examines every event that occurs in his life, he acquires experience, becomes careful, and thus progresses. Christ first asked for faith in the power of God, and only then would perform a miracle. If you believe in the power of God, you will be healed. Matthew 9, verse 29, Mark 9, verse 23. He used to say, Not as some wrongly say today. Man has powers, and if he believes in his powers, he can do anything. Doesn't the gospel teach us to believe? We agree, therefore, with that teaching. Yes, Christ did say believe, but he meant, do you believe in God? Do you believe that God can do this? He required an affirmation that the man believed in God, and then he would help. Nowhere does the gospel tell you to believe in yourself, but to believe in God, that God can help, that God can heal. Some people, however, take this the wrong way and say, Man has powers and must believe in himself. To believe in one's self contains either egoism or demonism. Yeroda, when a miracle happens, these people say that it occurred because the person involved believed it could happen. The activity of the devil is hidden behind this egotistical position. They confuse what Christ said about believing in God with their own belief in themselves. This is where all the demonism in the world today begins. And they tell you, have no respect for young or old to acquire your own personality. This is why you hear slogans like, 
trample on them, destroy them, so that you can succeed. Respect is considered to be the established conformity, and so without it the devil triumphs. If a child speaks, even slightly impudently, to his parents or elders, the grace of God abandons him, how much more so if man makes this behavior the norm? What do you say when someone claims to believe in God, but does not believe that God protects us? Then he makes himself God. How does he believe in God? Every morning he makes the sign of the cross, and so forth. Then he says, I believe in God, but God gave us a brain to think with and to do whatever we want. Or he may say, I am God. Doesn't the sacred scripture say, You are gods, and all of you sons of the Most High? Psalm 82, verse 6. He doesn't think that to be God through grace, one must have the grace of God. But in his mind, he simply makes himself God. It is one thing to have the grace of God and to become God through grace, and quite another to make himself God. This is the confusion. He makes himself God and finally ends up becoming an atheist. A time will come when all will believe. Geroda, how does it happen that people with faith end up becoming atheists? On this subject, there may be two possible cases. In one case, a person can be very faithful, with the power of God active in his life and obvious in many events. But then this same person becomes confused on the subject of faith. This happens, for example, when someone undertakes the ascetic life with egoism, approaching the spiritual life in an indiscriminate and selfish manner. He says, for example, Whatever saint so-and-so did, I will also do. And his spiritual exercises are indiscriminate. Gradually, however, without realizing it, he comes under the illusion that even if he hasn't yet reached the stature of saint so-and-so, he must be close. So he continues his spiritual exercises. But while divine grace assisted him before he had this thought, now it begins to abandon him. For what does the grace of God have to do with pride? Consequently, he can no longer do the ascetic work as he did before, and he now has to exert himself. This exertion leads to anxiety. Pride follows suit with its accompanying turmoil, creating confusion. And whereas before he had done so much and divine grace was active with spiritual events, he slowly begins to have thoughts of disbelief and to doubt the existence of God. The second case is when an illiterate person decides to concern himself with the doctrines of the faith. Well, he just isn't well. It's one thing to take a look at the doctrines and become somewhat familiar with them. But even a well-educated person, if he approaches the doctrines with pride, will be deprived of divine grace and begin to have doubts. Of course, I am not referring to someone who is devout. Even if uneducated, he can take a discreet look at the doctrines of the faith to the extent of his ability and come to understand them quite well. But if an unspiritual person starts concerning himself with the doctrinal aspects of the faith, he, even though he may have believed a little before, will now not believe at all. Yeronda, unbelief has spread widely in our time. Yes, but often you can see, even among those who say they don't believe in God, that there is still a little hidden faith in them. Once a young man told me, I don't believe there is a God. Come a little closer, I told him. Do you hear that nightingale singing? Who gave that beautiful gift to that bird? At once the poor young man was moved, and the harshness of unbelief went away, and the appearance of his young face was altered. Another time, two visitors had come to my Kalivi. They were about 45 years old and lived a very worldly life. As we monks say, because this life is vain, we reject everything. They too, but from the opposite point of view, said, There is no other life, and while still young, abandoned their studies and began to live a completely worldly life. They had reached the point of becoming spiritual and physical wrecks, the father of one died from worrying about him. The other squandered his mother's property and made her suffer from a heart condition. After our conversation, they saw things differently. We have become useless, they admitted. 
I gave one an icon for his mother. I went to give the other an icon, but he wouldn't accept it. Give me one of those little boards you are sawing, he said. I don't believe in God. I believe in the saints. Then I told him, whether it's a mirror or a cover from a tin can, unless the rays of the sun fall upon it, it won't shine. The saints were enlightened by the rays of the grace of God, just as the stars received light from the sun. These poor young people today are so confused over the various theories they are taught. I had once observed at the Kalibi two Marxists about 50 years old who joined the groups of young people in order to confuse them with their theories. Marxists do not believe so that when you try to prove to them the existence of God, they condemn God and ask endless questions. Why this and why that and so forth? The prophet Isaiah says that those who do not want to be saved do not understand. Compare Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10. Once I told them, Do you see the stars? They are not bolted up there. Someone is holding them up in the heavens. Everything the prophets said about Christ was fulfilled. We have so many martyrs who were formerly unbelievers, executioners, pagans, and then believed in Christ and became his witnesses. Some had their tongues severed so they would not speak of Christ, and without a tongue they became more eloquent witnesses to Christ. Every day we have so many saints who are celebrated. The saints are a living presence, and even when we don't find them, they find us. Many desert ascetics who don't have a calendar and don't know which saint is to be celebrated on a given day will say, Saints of this day intercede for us, and these saints will appear to them and reveal their names, which are sometimes difficult and unfamiliar names. Later the ascetics will look at a calendar and notice that on such and such a date, the saints who appeared to them were celebrated. On June 3, 1979, because the elder did not remember which saint was to be celebrated on that day and he could not find his glasses to check the calendar, he had just moved in his Kalivi at Panaguda, but was not yet settled. He was doing the Koboskini prayers by saying, Saints of this day, intercede for us. Then Saint Lucilianos, who is celebrated on that day, appeared to him and repeated three times his difficult name. What do you think of that? Then the Marxists again responded by asking, Why do saints go to the monks and not to the people who need them? How did they come here? I asked them, by plane? No, by car, they replied. Good. On the way here, how many roadside shrines did you see? They didn't just sprout from the ground with the spring rains. People were helped by the saints, and out of devotion have built those shrines, and now light the lamps to honor the saints. The more spiritual people get rid of material things, the more they rise toward heaven. Materialists also enjoy something. They make, for example, so many cups. They make so much money. But if they make more cups, they earn more money. But you make your propaganda only and stop there. You have nothing to enjoy. You are the most unfortunate of all, because should you achieve what you want, you will have no other ideal but the torment of a Marxist slavery. Finally, they complimented me. Father, you are a very good man, righteous, wise. In any case, whether people want it or not, a time will come when everyone will believe because they will reach an impasse and Christ will intervene. Dear listeners, our time is up. Thank you for listening. We will continue once again where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. of Orthodox Spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea.